If you've watched some of our previous videos, it's likely that you've seen me using my lab radar chronograph. You know, it's a good tool to measure velocity. It's easy to use, very fast to set up, and it's quite reliable, as long as you have a good power supply. And related to that, one little tip I'll give you is to use not the AA batteries, which you can do as a backup, but go ahead and get one of their USB power packs, and that works so much better. But you know, I think many of us are not really tapping into the full potential of the lab radar. You see, when I select a new bullet for testing and load workup, I look at a number of uh, different factors. One of those, of course, is the price, price per bullet, let's say. Another thing that I look at is its overall design. I'll try to take a close look at that bullet and determine if it has a secant or a tangent ogive. Some of those bullets will work better in some rifles and some others will work better in yet other rifles. I pay a little bit of attention to that as well. I've also gotten into the habit of looking closely at the overall length of that bullet. You know, there's this big uh, emphasis or a lot of interest in using what's called long for caliber bullets recently because those tend to draw, have higher ballistic coefficients and uh, there's a lot of interest and we'll talk about that in a bit. There's a lot of interest in these high ballistic coefficient bullets. But more to the point, those long for caliber bullets may be very attractive to a lot of folks, so I've started taking a very close look at the overall length of those bullets. And if that bullet is just too long for the rate of twist that's on my rifle, or if it's really close, I'm very hesitant to choose that bullet because I've seen lots of problems where a supposedly great bullet on paper just doesn't perform very well in some of my rifles. And I think some of the problem with those individual or particular bullets is that the bullet is just a little bit too long to properly stabilize. And of course, another factor that I look very closely at is the ballistic coefficient. And I've kind of gotten into the habit of looking more closely at the G7 ballistic coefficient which isn't always available, and so sometimes I still need to look at the G1 ballistic coefficient. You see, there's a lot of discussion and rumors out there that ballistic coefficients have been artificially inflated by the marketing folks in these bullet companies. Well, this is where the lab radar can come in and help us out because we can calculate an estimate of ballistic coefficient using the data that's already being collected by the lab radar. All we need to do is to remove the SD card. Well, that assumes you purchased an, M, uh, an SD card and installed it prior to shooting. But I think most of us do that. So what we need to do is remove that SD card and then insert that SD card into your desktop or laptop computer. Now, most computers today have an SD card reader. If yours does not, then you can purchase an SD card reader for less than 20 bucks. Pretty darn easy to do, and then it's going to just plug into one of your USB ports on your desktop or laptop computer. Then, simply copy the file from your SD card, copy it, I like to copy it, not cut it, but copy it and paste it to your desktop computer. Now let's jump over to our desktop computer and let me show you how to calculate an estimate of ballistic coefficient. Now I've just downloaded about a dozen of these lab radar files. These are all ASCII text files stored in what's called a comma-separated values format. Uh, and I have those associated with Microsoft Excel. And what I'm looking for is I am looking for records where I have a measurement of velocity 
at 100 yards. I've never or very, very rarely seen where the lab radar can uh, record a measurement beyond 100 yards. Uh, and ideally, we have as much separation in range as possible to calculate a good estimate of ballistic coefficient. If we make our estimate of ballistic coefficient using muzzle velocity and you know 10 meters or 25 meters, that's not going to be a very reliable estimate of ballistic coefficient. So the further or the longest difference in range the better off we're going to be. And as I said, the best I have seen or been able to get uh, is at about 100 yards. So what I have here is I have a number of different lab radar files and in each of these I have at least one record where we have a recording of the velocity of the bullet at 100 yards. So I have started creating a new Microsoft Excel spreadsheet and this spreadsheet already contains two records where we have velocities at both the muzzle and at 100 yards and this is from session 64 another three recordings from session 79 and another recording from session 98 let's go to the next file File 100 is our next session, and here we see we have one more record where we have a velocity at 100 yards. So I'm going to select this section of the CSV file. I'm going to right-click on it, and I'm going to copy these data. And now I'm going to return to my new spreadsheet, and I'm going to paste these data into these same cells. And for future reference, I like to add the session number that this particular data came from. And then, of course, just for some um, visualization purposes, I'm kind of highlighting in a little bit of a gray color one session versus the next versus the next, so I can much more easily uh, reference them at a glance. That certainly is not necessary or mandatory uh, just to proceed with this uh, calculation. So I'm going to go ahead and copy the data from these remaining files into my new Excel spreadsheet, and then we'll go from there. Okay, I just finished copying these data into my spreadsheet. And by the way, these data are for the Sierra 168 grain tipped match king for my 308 Winchester Ruger precision rifle. Now that I have my data in hand, the two columns that I'm going to be using are this column B, the muzzle velocity, and column E, the 100 yard velocity for the same bullet. I could, if I want to, I could just could delete columns C and column D. That wouldn't hurt anything at all. The next step then is to use JBM Ballistics to make my calculation. Now I've been using JBM Ballistics website for quite a number of years and there's some really really good resources out there. This one in particular will calculate ballistic coefficient from a near velocity, and I always like to use the muzzle velocity, and a far velocity. Um, and so I will be using my muzzle velocity and my 100 yard velocity. So let me walk through one of these calculations. The first calculation that you can see here has a near velocity of 2,528 feet per second and a far velocity at 100 yards of 2,374. My separation is 100 yards. I need to make sure that gets changed. 
and we'll begin by calculating a G1 drag coefficient. Next, we need to pay some attention to this area here, the environmental conditions under which this measurement was made. And if you've taken very good notes of your range sessions, all you have to do is plug in these data and you're all set. If you haven't done that, well then what you could do, of course, is enter the altitude and the altitude in feet above sea level for where I shoot, and that shooting range is 4,844 feet. And then I can turn on standard atmosphere at that altitude. Now go ahead and run my calculation. And there is the result that I'm interested in. I'm going to go ahead and copy this return to the Excel spreadsheet and plug in this estimate. Paste. I can now return to the JBM ballistics page and this is kind of a really handy little step. I'm just going to go back. Click back on my browser and now I'm going to change it to request a G7 estimate. Calculate this and now copy the G7 estimate and plug it into the spreadsheet. I'm going to go ahead and continue this for all 30 of these samples and then we'll take it to the next step. Okay, I just finished up the last of my uh, calculations. Now before we proceed to the next step, I'd like to look this over and look for any anomalous data. Like for instance, this one right here. And this is an extremely low ballistic coefficient relative to what we're seeing elsewhere. So I'm going to return to the JBM Ballistics website. I'm going to punch these numbers in once again just to make sure I didn't make a mistake myself. And I have another one here that is extremely high. So I'm going to uh, recalculate this one as well. So to help me, I will highlight this record and this record as well. 2,594 is my initial velocity or near velocity and 2,392 uh, is my far velocity. Start off with a G1, calculate this, and indeed it comes up with the same answer. So I didn't uh, make a mistake myself. There's just something odd about uh, this individual flight or this individual um, record. Let's look at the second one. 2,471 feet per second at muzzle and 2,358 feet per second at 100 yards. And this again is also correctly entered but just in this case anomalously high. Let's see how all that plays out in the following calculations. Now there's a variety of ways uh, in which we can calculate the average ballistic coefficient for all these samples. But what I like to use, I like to use the data analysis tool pack that comes with Microsoft Excel. I'm going to click data from the menu, data analysis, and I'm going to run the descriptive statistics tool. My input range is these two columns. So I make sure that it's grouped by column. I'm going to turn on the check that says label in the first row, which is correct. And then my 
summary statistics is what I'm asking for. And I'm going to come back up here and tell it that I want to select or identify an output range. Click this little button right over here that allows me to select the cell that's going to be the upper left corner of the little table that it's going to write for me. So I'll just click, you know, right down here should work just fine. Now I'm going to click OK to have it run the calculation. Well, the statistics that I'm interested in are the mean, the median, and the standard deviation. In particular, let's take a look at this right here. The mean G1 ballistic coefficient for this bullet, based on the measurements that I have, is 0 0.493. Sierra indicates that it should be 0 0.535 whenever our velocities are above 2,050 feet per second, muzzle velocities. And in our case, all of our muzzle velocities were above 2,050. But we've got these two anomalous records. So what happens if I remove these? I'm going to run that same tool once again. The input is the same. The output range is going to change. I'm going to go ahead and tell it to start here in this case. And click OK to run that once again. You know my mean really did not change very much at all. You may be thinking that I just proved that bullet manufacturers are indeed inflating the ballistic coefficient. But hold on a minute, we haven't really talked about or dealt with uncertainty yet. First of all, all of our estimates are based on a relatively short range, muzzle velocity to 100 yards. And ideally, the ballistic coefficient will be calculated on a much further or farther range 200 you know muzzle velocity to 200 yards or 300 yards and that will of course give you a better estimate of ballistic coefficient secondly we have a potential bias uh, in, inherent in our analysis and that we accepted the atmospheric defaults based on elevation and if I had indeed plugged in the current conditions while I was shooting, I would have arrived at or achieved an even better estimate of ballistic coefficient. But the other piece that we haven't uh, dealt with yet is the vari variability itself in all of those estimates. So the way that we do this is we'll take the median value or the middlemost value and then look at the standard deviation. We'll take that standard deviation value and multiply it by 2. Really, statistically, it's 1.96, but for almost all applications, multiplying standard deviation by 2 will work really, really well. And then we're going to take the median and we're going to apply plus or minus two standard deviations to that value. And that's going to give us a confidence interval of 99%. And we know then that statistically the true ballistic coefficient of that bullet is within that confidence interval. And indeed we see that the estimate used and published by Sierra falls nicely within that confidence interval. What can we do with all this data, or did I just prove that it's useless? Uh, no, I don't think it's useless data either. Number one, it confirms that the estimates that are being published by Sierra are well within the statistical bounds for the same bullet. 
But more importantly, what we can do with this is we can use these data when we are truing our ballistic drop tables or our trajectory drop tables. You know, you can calculate the drop tables for your bullet and your load. And then when you go out to the range, it's very, very common, at least for me, and I know others have said the same thing, that the bullet strikes a little low or it strikes a little high or something like this. And normally we attribute that to our error. But if we are seeing that consistently the bullet is striking lower than predicted by those drop tables and your rifle is zeroed correctly at the range it's supposed to be zeroed for, then what we can do uh, is we can adjust the trajectory calculation to fit what we're actually observing. And that's what we call truing our drop tables. And probably the best way to do this is to adjust the ballistic coefficient that's being used to generate those drop tables. Look, we know the actual velocity, so we can't say that, well, the velocity must really be slower than we're actually calculating. That's uh, not a very valid way to adjust those drop tables. A more realistic or practical approach to truing our ballistic tables is to adjust the ballistic coefficient that's being used to generate those estimates or the trajectory curve. And using the data that we just calculated, the range of valid values for that ballistic, for that bullet, we can plug in a slightly different or slightly lower ballistic coefficient, let's say, if we see that our bullet is routinely uh, hitting or impacting lower than it should, or we can bump up the ballistic coefficient if we see that routinely the uh, bullets are impacting higher than they should. Uh, lots of variables, of course, go into those things. Make sure that you have your uh, atmospheric conditions entered correctly first before you start uh, playing around with the ballistic coefficient entered into that drop table. But this is a good tool, good technique to use to really true up the um, drop tables and improve your first shot hits at range. Hey, thanks for watching this special edition of Extreme Reloading.